What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Ninja Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Shows. Rebel Moon. Brian. I was out when I saw the dude that looked like bison in a tie. I was out. People have seen it already and say already that it, this is a story that makes no sense, that is a, another Black Adam regurgitation of other movies we've already seen. You threw your money away to this dude that did 47 Ronin, $57 million, and he hasn't given you a single scene. Now this dude is, you get, probably gave this dude 200 some odd million dollars to give you a movie that everybody's telling you that is whack. The audience store score, Brian. I usually see a bad movie with an audience score around the 80s and stuff. So. This is in the, the last time I saw it was in the 70s. 72. Brian, when are the shenanigans are gonna be over, Brian? We said this a long time ago, that people are gonna be paying money out the wazoo to get as much content as they possibly can so they can get subscribers onto their platform. When is enough is enough? Back up, as always, let's back up. Yes, Rebel yes, Moon, yes, yes. directed and written by Zack Snyder. This is the project that was originally pitched to Disney and Lucasfilm as a Star Wars movie years ago. They obviously said no. They said After hell no. <laughs> Netflix, after Zack's experience at Warner Brothers with the DCEU, gave him a lot of money and a lot of creative freedom to come over, and this is the project that he's delivering. Um, I'll connect this back to Carl Rinch, because that story, I want you to do that rant again, because that story is great. At least Zack delivered a movie to his credit. It is currently sitting at 20% on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, we know Zack is polarizing on his best day with critics. But it says something to me that this is the lowest reviewed film of his career because he's operating outside of the studio machine. This is all what he wants. There is no WB screwing around with his cut or his edit. Netflix said, blank check, you write, you shoot, you direct, you put up on the screen what you want. And critics and audiences alike are saying no. That, to me, is far more of an indictment of him than some of the previous projects where he was under the thumb of the studio. But Pablo, it goes back to our discussion when the trailer came out. And we had the pros and cons discussion of what we saw. What did we say? It's probably going to be the best of Zach. And the worst is that. And you read the reviews. That's exactly what it is. Because even the people savaging the movie are like, yo, there's scenes, there's sequences in here that are incredible. But it's an incoherent, complete gobbledygook mess all around. <clears throat> it. and, it's, and and we, we commented on this, the thing about the tropes and the stealing from the other movie. I mean, you got dudes with lightsabers, red and blue, fighting in the trail. Like, it's not inspired by Star Wars. It's a ripoff of Star Wars in those scenes. And people are seeing through it. If we know Zack Snyder, based on his comments, based on the comments that he's made before regarding people not understanding the movies that he makes, it's you that doesn't understand, Brian. You don't understand the movie. Oh, well, we'll talk about it when we get a chance to see it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually disappointed, at least out here. I, you know, I was debating whether to go before the reviews hit. I was debating. I was disappointed. My city was not getting a theatrical screening of this because I was oh, actually wow. interested. And and it's it, and so I don't have a chance to see it on the theater. Theater, But, you know, when the reviews hit, I kind of was like, all right, well, now I'm good with, with not having seen it in the theater. But I think that. You know, the narrative over the years, and I think in the case of Justice League, there is some validity to it. It's basically been like Zack's been screwed by the studio, right? That's always been the... But when you see this and you see the reaction, I think you have to revisit that history bigger picture and say that some of the good work that he's delivered in Watchmen and in 300 and even some of the high points of, of Man of Steel, which I know I like more than you do, 
don't we have to give the studios credit in hindsight for reining him in a little bit, which might have allowed some of the more positive aspects of those projects to show through when you see if he's left completely to his own devices, you can he's delivering him. something that doesn't <laughs> connect with anybody. And he's already like, this is the weirdest, like he's already circling the wagons and talking up his director's cut. And I'm like, director's cut? Nobody forced you to edit the first version. Why are you pray, playing it like, well, if you, he's even got a quote. He's like, if you see the director's cut, it's a different movie. Like, what, what is happening here? <laughs> like, he's literally at war with himself when I read that. And Netflix's eyes, right? They don't care. As long as people watch it, they don't really care if it's good or yeah, not, yeah, right? Yeah, but. But, then give, give me some of that money so I can make something dope. Yeah, but, but, the, but the point is, this is supposed to be world building and universe building, and it's not going anywhere, right? It's like a, <clears throat> it's like a, it's like a car crash. It's like, yeah, if you came upon a massive pileup, you probably would stop to look at it, but you're not going to go back to it over and over again. So once his contract with Rebel Moon with Netflix is over. Yeah, done. What happened? What does Zack Snyder do? Because studios, Ryan, I don't know if they will be as welcoming as Netflix was. Yeah, I agree. Because I, I think the, the closest proxy I can think of in, the, in sort of the last 25 years is Michael Bay. But the difference is that Michael Bay, from a box office standpoint, has generally hit a lot more than he's missed. So the reason why studios put up with his approach, the fact that critics generally hate anything he does. I actually like most of his stuff more than, more than critics do. But the reason why studios like Michael Bay is because A, he's almost always under budget, which Zach we know is not. Zach is way <laughs> over budget. And second is Michael Bay generally turns you a profit, yeah. even if the critics don't like the movie. Yeah. So. We, I think we are generally seeing with what's happening at Marvel and Star Wars and Disney in general, the days of the 250, $300 million budget for these blockbuster films is going away for a while because the numbers just don't justify them. Yeah. And I don't see Zack Snyder as being a successful high probability bet in a world where he's given 75 to $100 million to work with. I know he's had some success with that Army of the Dead um, series a little bit. That's probably the best thing he's done. But, like, that's not what he likes. Like, he likes excess. He likes big. And to do that, he needs 200 million plus budgets. I just don't see studios viewing that as a good bet coming off of this project. This is going to be, it is going to hurt his career. There's no question. I don't, I, mean, I don't think it'd be done as a director. The worst directors who have made movies, like, Sorry. you know, outside. But, you know, Zack Snyder on like a high profile sci-fi fantasy blockbuster project. I think, I think it's going to be a while before you see that again. He's going to have to have a small hit somewhere else. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> go ahead. Do your wrench thing though, because the, the wrench is like this, that, you know, as I said, at least Zack did deliver a finished movie. But this like, dude did it. This dude took almost $60 million and went DJing, yo. <laughs> buying luxury, buying crypto. You can't give me $25 million to make a movie, a dope movie, yo, at that? <clears throat> Get me in a room, yo. Get us in a room with you. Uh, uh, to picture of, something. The director of Godzilla Minus One is looking at that being like, wait, what? <laughs> You paid him six million? times what I had to work with. Like, and he didn't even deliver a room. <laughs> Brian, I've been pitching this idea. I didn't put it out last time because the audio was horrible, but uh, I'll give you a, a, a clean idea right now, Netflix. Easy. Macaulay Culkin. Oh, Bring I think him. you did pitch this. Yeah, but I didn't put it out. I, I don't think I put it out to... I don't okay. think I put it on the show. 
Um, Macaulay Culkin, looking pretty good these days, looking healthy. Bring him back. Home Alone. Rated R. This dude, this dude is a, some sort of contract or whatever for security. He has his own fortress. The, the guys coming to get him are the descendants of the sticky bandits. <laughs> and these guys aren't just your regular criminals. These are a little bit more high tech, more sophisticated. Rated R? You kidding me? Yeah, you want to give 47 Ronin failure $60 million for an idea that was pretty interesting, but the ex where was the proof of concept for success that you thought $60 million was a reasonable price tag for whatever idea he came up with that and, and delivered nothing. Well, as I said, that's the fascination of, you know, in the Carl Rinch case, his one blockbuster was a massive commercial failure. And so Netflix's solution to that was to give him more control, <laughs> right? Like you just think about the logic of that in hindsight and that, and you see it now with Zach. And it's like, we talked about it all the time, the pros and cons. I mean, I, I would say every Zack Snyder movie to me that I've ever seen, there's always sequences that I'm envious of that I think are like, there's real skill in this. But I always walk out of his movies being like, who's editing this? Like, this, where this is, is the person in the room saying no to you? And there was, we know, there was no one in the room saying no for this movie. And it appears that it went off the rails. This is, uh, uh, it is. You, even me, he can't do it all. I think he believes he can. He does every can, everything he can for his vision to come to fruition. And he hires the people that are just going to do what he asks to do. Yeah. Are his collaborators yes men? Possibly. Or he has like, possibly because there's money there. You know, there's opportunity there. But. But, it, but it's clear that like. It, it, I think at this point, I mean, we'll see again, we'll do a review of it when we get a chance to see it in about a week or so. But I, at some point, it's like you, you can't be a visionary if nobody <laughs> sees what you see. You can't. Like, I understand you're going to be like, oh, I'm ahead of my time or I'm like a man out of time, like, you know, but at some point you, you need to deliver. This is a results business. Yeah. You know, and it's like, Net I think Netflix, obviously, this philosophy they had that led to the Ringe contract, led to Snyder, led more, much more successfully to Ryan Johnson. There's a, see, there's an example of a guy who writes, directs, has a vision, and generally knows his audience well enough in terms of how to execute it, right? Consistent yeah. to make David, money. David, David Finch, yeah, too. David yeah, David so Finch. like, yeah. there's pros and cons. I just don't think Netflix is going to be doing deals like this in the future. And I think as all these companies in streaming are focused more on profitability than on adding subscribers, they're going to be cutting these types of contracts. I don't know, Brian, because it all depends on who the person is. If it's Ryan, somebody like Ryan Coogler, who can direct, write, you know what I'm saying? Who can do multiple things and be good at it. It seems like Zach's thing is visual effects, yo. Just do that. But he doesn't want to do that. He no. wants to be the man in charge of his vision. Yeah, Zach and, seems more. Yeah, Zach seems more cut out to be a cinematographer than he does a director, right? Certainly. Put him behind the camera. He gives you imagination and he gives yeah. you viewpoint for action, especially that's interesting. But you're right. Give him control. Give him the keys to the car, and the car gets totaled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he wants so. to keep. 
He but, wants to do no. awesome things and cool things. But I also think like, you know, Fincher, so Fincher is an interesting one because he, the reason why I think he's at Netflix is because of his working style, right? He's a difficult director to work for, 90 takes, 100 takes. That degree of precision for a studio is tough to tolerate. But I think like the Kuglers, clearly like Christopher Nolan, now Greta Gerwig, like those directors will want to stay on the big screen. Like, I, I don't think, like, yeah, would Netflix be wise to give Chris Nolan a huge contract to do whatever he wants? Yeah, sure they would, but he's not taking that. He doesn't need it, you know? So I think those directors are fine working in the studio machine because they they get enough control and they deliver profits and they understand how to manage budget and they actually are visionary directors. Um, I just, yeah, I'm just disappointed because there was a real window here. I thought for this, this project to be something because the Marvels, because Aquaman 2, because these other movies were failing. If this thing was even decent, I think it would have gotten a lot of buzz. And now it feels like the only buzz is getting is for the wrong reasons. I had no hopes for this, but all I have to say is man. Get us in the office so we can sit down and have some conversations. Cause it's a great point. Like, I don't know how Netflix works with these things, but like, did no one there get a look at an early cut of this? I mean, you would think if it is ripped off from as many projects like Star Wars that there people are saying, no one in the room was like, I've seen this exact thing before, right? It's, you know, with the Black Adam thing, like, the difference there is we know The Rock basically wouldn't care, right? He basically would just overrule whatever <laughs> feedback there was. Yeah. And his argument would be people want to see the same scene redone. They just want to see me do it. Do it. <laughs> that, that would be his counter to that. Yeah. But in Zach's case, he doesn't have that to stand on. So there was nobody at Netflix that was like, dude, you just completely shoplifted a Star Wars sequence and change the color palette a little. Like nobody ever says that. Like, I don't, it just seems mind boggling. Yeah, mind -boggling. you have to question really the business model. Can this, cause it's like, are you in it to put, give us great content or just throw it? Cause that's, it's like, if you're a stockholder, you're looking at them like, Yo, you guys are throwing away money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, let us know in the <laughs> let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of all this, um, and yeah, Netflix, give us a shot. You you know the email. I'll, I'll put it in the description below, man. Because it's, it's, it's easy, yo. To put us in a room for an hour, it'll be the greatest idea session you've ever had. We will see you next time on Nerd Jim Report. The show goes on. Yeah!